Astăzi vom discuta despre tabelul periodic al elementelor și anume al acestuia. Aristotel a fost printre primii oameni de știință care a vorbit despre elemente chimice și aranjarea acestor. Încă din antichitate, oamenii cunoșteau câteva elemente chimice, cum ar fi aurul, argintul și cuprul, deoarece acestea pot fi găsite în natură, în stare nativă și sunt relativ simplu de extras. Totuși, conceptul că există în lume un număr limitat de elemente din care este compus Universul a fost propus prima dată de către filozoful grec Aristotel. Deci putem spune că Aristotel este primul care a vorbit despre elementele chimice. După Aristotel au fost mulți oameni de știință care au încercat aranjarea elementelor într-o anumită ordine pe măsură ce acestea erau descoperite. Unul dintre aceștia a fost Antoine, Antoine Laurent de Lavoisier. Lavoisier, chimist francez, a scris în 1789 lucrarea intitulată Tratat elementar de chimie, considerată ca fiind primul manual modern de chimie. Lucrarea sa conținea toate cele 23 de elemente chimice cunoscute până în acel moment, printre care oxigenul, azotul, hidrogenul, fosforul, mercurul, zincul sau sulful. Tratatul, deși contestat de mulți chimici iluștri ai timpului, reprezintă baza listei moderne a elementelor, clasificate de la Voisier, în metale și nemetale. Un alt chimist important a fost Johann Wolfgang Doberainer. Acesta a început timid în anul 1817 clasificarea elementelor. Astfel, în 1828, el și-a dat seama că unele elemente formează grupe cu proprietăți similare, grupe pe care le denumește triade, exemple de triade clasificate de Doberainer, și anume clor, brom și iod, altă triadă calciu, stronțiu și bariu, sau sul, seleniu și telur, litiu, sodiu și potasiu. Și în a ziua de astăzi, în tabelul periodic, aceste elemente se găsesc în aceeași grupă. John Newlands Newlands a fost primul chimist care a aranjat elementele în serii de câte 8, în ordinea maselor atomice relative. El a publicat în 1865 Legea Octavelor, în care a aranjat toate elementele cunoscute la acea vreme, începând cu hidrogen și terminând cu toriu, în șapte grupuri de câte opt, pe care acestea le asemăna cu octavele din muzică. În urma acestei aranjări a rezultat tabelul de mai jos. Bineînțeles că părintele tabelului periodic nu poate fi altul decât Dimitri Mendeleev. Dimitri Mendeleev, chimist rus, a fost primul care a publicat o versiune a tabelului periodic în anul 1869, în timp ce încerca să organizeze elementele. La acea dată se cunoșteau 63 de elemente. El a scris elementele și proprietățile acestora pe bucăți de hârtie, ca niște cărți de joc, și apoi le-a aranjat și rearanjat până când și-a dat seama că formează, în mod regulat, anumite grupe de elemente. În urma acestor aranjări, într-un final, i-a ieșit acest tabel. Observăm că în unele cazuri, Mendeleev a lăsat locuri libere, adică căsuțe libere, în care a prevăzut că vor fi plasate elemente noi necunoscute la acel moment. Mendeleev a aranjat elementele în ordinea crescătoare a maselor lor atomice. În tabelul rezultat, elementele cu proprietăți asemănătoare se găseau unele sub altele în aceeași coloană. Tabelul lui Mendeleev este foarte asemănător cu cel actual, explicând relația dintre elementele chimice, precum și proprietățile generale ale acestor. Mendeleev a fost capabil să prezică descoperirea unor elemente pe care le-a numit eca elemente, a căror existență nu era nici măcar bănuită pe vremea sa. Majoritatea previziunilor sale au fost confirmate de descoperirile ulterioare din chimie.
2019 was dedicated as the International Year of the Periodic Table by UNESCO to celebrate 150 years since Dimitri Mendeleev first formulated the modern table of chemical elements. Of course, science isn't done by lone geniuses no matter what the movies tell us, and Mendeleev wasn't truly the first to create a table. Organised lists of elements have been drawn up by alchemists for centuries, even if their content was a little uh, off. Then. In the early 1800s, John Dalton published a list of chemical elements, although his symbols never really caught on. These were certainly a more complete list of actual elements and their properties than what came before. And more notably, German chemist Lothar Meyer published a number of actual periodic tables as early as the 1850s, including tables that left gaps for potentially undiscovered elements, an action that's normally credited only to Mendeleev. But Mendeleev went one further than Meyer and started making predictions about out those then unknown elements, and for that he usually gets the main credit for the periodic table. While most people probably know what the periodic table looks like because it's on the walls of so many school classrooms and labs, they might be surprised to see that Mendeleev's 1869 version looks like, well, it doesn't really look like something we'd recognise today. It looks like just a simple list with some mild attempts at formatting. There's very little to it at first glance. So this is the thing we're celebrating 150 years later? Well, the lack of detail here is understandable. In 1869, Mendeleev and others didn't have that much information to go on. If you compare to information often seen on a modern periodic table, we didn't know about electrons and protons, so the atomic number was out. Quantum mechanics and good quality spectroscopy was another half century away, so electron configuration couldn't be on there. And since isotopes weren't known, and mass spectrometry was also a few decades away, the masses were very approximate, so lacked the decimal places seen in most tables used by working chemists. All there was to add to the table was the shorthand letter for the element's name, and its unprecise and possibly miscalculated mass. So it looks like just a list, but if you do turn it sideways and flip it around and maybe squint a bit, you can start to see some of the overlap with the modern version, which is actually a mid-20th century invention often credited to the American chemist Glenn Seaborg. By 1870, Mendeleev's system was starting to take better shape, and his natural system of elements has more information on it, although mostly just the simple compounds that the elements were known to form. And a side note, truncated to just the letters and their relative positions, starts to look a little like something we'd see today if you were to draw some boxes around it. In 1871, the table was much more complete, and this is the type of layout that hung around the longest. I have a similar copy in a textbook dated about 1920, and you can even see it in the background of photos of Glenn Seaborg from the 1950s, though that contains much more modern data. If we look closely at the rows of Mendeleev's original, though, we can begin to see that this does look more like the periodic table than you might think from just glancing at it. You can see the main group elements are in the right columns and in the right order, and what Mendeleev has done differently to our modern version is to interleave the d-block transition elements into the rows between them. But if you know nothing about atomic structure, then it does make sense to do something like this. A lot of early transition metal elements, like scandium, do exhibit similar valency and oxidation states to the peapock elements, like aluminium. So putting them all in the same column does feel right knowing nothing else, even if grouping manganese with the halogens is a big red flag that something might not be quite right with the layout. Now, with some modern aesthetic interpretation and colour coding, what's going on becomes a little more obvious. This means if we do a little bit of resizing of this table, then slide all of those main group elements and their rows to the right, the picture becomes a little clearer. The fact that copper, silver and gold appear twice on Mendeleev's table helps demonstrate that he had the right idea, but was possibly just reluctant to generate 17 separate columns of data and create duplicate groups just for these metals. If we then compress that together, merging those twinned coinage metals, we start to see the periodic table take the form we already know. At this point, Mendeleev has left lots of gaps, and it almost looks like he's been very overzealous with them, but again, this is understandable because the mass of the elements makes a very big jump this far down in the table, and this jump would eventually be explained by the f-block elements. But the majority of those remained undiscovered in Mendeleev's time, so we can just delete those faces or pretend we've shifted them away into their own block. Now everything begins to snap neatly into place. All that's left is to delete didinium, 
which said that not to be an element, but a mixture of neodymium and praseodymium. Did eat erbium, as that got confused with terbium for a long time, and then shuffle lanthanum into group 3. That's your preference for depicting where the F-box should go. And that's it. We're still missing the noble gases, which were another decade or so away from being discovered, but it turns out Mendeleev's simple looking list really was our modern periodic table in disguise. <laughs>